All right, welcome. So in that last video, we talked a little bit about sizes of infinities and we used that idea to argue that there must be some language that is not decidable. Um, but that was just an ex existence proof, which can be a little bit unsatisfying. That just shows there is some language that's undecidable, but it, we didn't say which one. We haven't told you which one it is or anything about it. That might be something that you're interested in. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Can we find our first undecidable language? So the first undecidable language was demonstrated um, by Alan Turing, uh, or the existence of one, um, uh, by in his original paper in 1936. Uh, where he also intro he introduced a Turing machine. He also proved that there was the existence of a universal Turing machine. So let's take a look at that. Let's look at this language here. We mentioned this in a previous video. ATM, we have um, all, and remember this is encodings of machines now, all encodings of machines M and W, such that M is a Turing machine that accepts the string W. Now, we're I'm going to prove right now with this uh, construction here that ATM this uh, language is recognizable. So we can make a Turing machine that recognizes it, even though we cannot make one that decides it. We'll try and prove that here a little bit. To do this, we're gonna make a machine that recognizes it, obviously. I'm gonna give this machine a very special name. I'm gonna call it UTM for Universal Turing Machine, because if we can actually build this machine, what can it do? It can take as an input a description of another Turing machine. Think of this as a computer program and some input for that and then simulate it so it can run any machine it wants any turing machine this utm can simulate any turing machine which is quite powerful okay let's see how it's going to work well on this input m and w where m is some encoding of a turing machine and w is its input we're going to just straightforwardly argue that we can simulate m on input w i'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that right now because we've already done some good simulations in previous videos in particular, we simulated a non-deterministic Turing machine on a, on a deterministic one. We're going to use a very similar style to that, which is we're going to use maybe a multi-tape Turing machine. We're going to have one of our tapes used for simulation. One of our tapes might be uh, used for auxiliary variables to keep track of where we're at. And we're just going to simulate the machine as we go. Um, what's important is we're just going to keep simulating. If M ever accepts, we accept. If M ever rejects, we reject. What's implicit here but not explicit is if m never accepts or never rejects meaning it runs forever we run forever too and that's implicit here and it's very important so simulating um this turing machine we mentioned we're usually going to use some multi-tape turing machines similar to what we did in our previous proofs i'm not going to go into a lot of detail there i'm just going to hopefully assume that uh, we all accept that this is something that we can do. So again, I mentioned I'm going to I call this one UTM to call it a universal Turing machine to highlight that it can simulate any Turing machine. And I also kind of hinted at this that um, the uh, proof that the universal Turing machine exists that occurs in this paper by Alan Turing, it influenced uh, early mathematicians who are the early computer scientists to uh, think about the possibility of having stored programs or programs that you could load into a universal machine hardware that could run any program that you want. This is in contrast to previous uh, sort of envisioning of how computing machinery worked, which is that everything would be hard coded uh, with the exception of possibly the input right into hardware. So there are no programs. There are only circuits that have been pre-designed to do addition or multiplication or whatever it might be. Um, and that is actually painstaking. Imagine having to solder a circuit board for every new program that you wanted to create. This is also the um, origin of our term hard coding, which is the idea of making the code in hardware, literally hardware. When we talk about hard coding these days, we don't usually mean making it in hardware, but also doing some kind of software programming that is like this, that is as though we have forced it right, you know, right into the hardware. Um, to us, that, that's still a software thing these days, but it originated with this idea of only coding things in hardware. So I mentioned this also, that let's notice that the universal Turing machine recognizes ATM, but it does not decide it because to be able to decide it, it has to be able to reject all the strings that are not in ATM. And that includes the ones that, eight, that um, the Turing machine might run forever on. 
Okay, so this raises our question, is it possible for us to decide ATM? Could we make a better universal Turing machine, one that also rejected in the case of an infinite loop? And spoiler alert again, it is not. Turing gave a negative proof for this, showing it is impossible for us to decide the language ATM. And his ability to do this, or his technique, followed the technique of contour using diagonalization again. And also, I should mention, it also followed an earlier proof by Goidel uh, that came out, I believe, in 1931 that also relied on Cantor's diagonalization to show that the uh, uh, logical systems are any uh, sufficiently defined or well-defined logical system is incomplete. A very similar relation, a uh, very uh, similar proof to Turing's proof. Um, and uh, there are a couple other sort of proofs that are also similar using this diagonalization technique that all kind of overlap in, in their uh, conceptualizations. Um, and, and so Turing, in a sense, has borrowed these previous techniques from Cantor and Goidel to again show uh, a very similar result in the realm of computation. So let's follow his proof. Uh, let's go ahead and look at his uh, proof that ATM is not decidable. Um, and just like Cantor did with his diagonalization, we're going to assume that it is decidable. We're going to start with a, to try and get a contradiction, the assumption of the opposite of what we're trying to prove. So assume that it is decidable. If it is decidable, then there must be some Turing machine that decides it. And we're going to call it H to give it a name so we can talk about it. So let's assume there's some machine H that decides ATM. Notice I didn't call it UTM because we already know what UTM is and UTM does not decide ATM. So this is some other special machine. We'll call it H. Okay. Note that by definition, when H is run on MW, it will accept when M accepts W and it will reject if M rejects, okay, that's what ATM does too, but also it will reject if it loops forever, and that's gonna be important for us. Now we're gonna create a very special machine. This machine we're calling D for diagonalization. It's also a very weird machine. It has to diagonalize against this list of machines, and to do that, we're gonna to have to make it do something very weird. This machine D, takes as input a Turing machine. Now what it does is it runs that Turing machine on an encoding of itself. So the input that it gives to that Turing machine is the encoding of that Turing machine. So maybe that Turing machine is simple. It just detects even or odd length strings. Well, what we give it as an input is the string that describes it and it will, well, M, if M ran, if, if M was the even or odd length string detector, it will just accept or reject its own encoding if its own encoding was even or odd. So if it accepted even numbers, if its encoding was even, it would accept it. Otherwise, it would reject. It doesn't really matter what it will do on it. I mean, we care because what we're going to do is we're going to run H on it and see what it does. Remember what H does? H is our... Um, it decides ATM. So if M accepts M, H accepts. If M rejects M, H rejects. But also if M runs forever on M, H rejects. Okay, now what are we going to do? We're going to do something very bizarre here. If H ends up accepting, we're going to reject. If H ends up rejecting, we're going to accept. So we're going to do the opposite of whatever H says M does on M. Okay, very weird machine. Why did we design it? I don't know. We're, we follow me down the path because when we get to the contradiction at the end, you're going to say, aha, oh, it's a contradiction. That's why we designed our D in this way. Notice, remember in our Cantor proof, we were diagonalizing against these bits in, in our expression of numbers, and we were trying to show that one of our bits was always different. Well, that's what we're trying to show here. We're trying to show that D is not going to be equal to any of these machines, uh, these Turing machines that we could have designed. And we're going to do that by having it run a machine on itself. Eventually, we're going to run D on itself, and that's going to be our next bit. Imagine what happens if we run D on D. Well, what D does is it runs itself on encoding of itself. So it immediately runs itself on an encoding of itself. It doesn't actually carry that out or we'd be stuck in some infinite recursion. Instead, it just asks H. It says, hey, H, you, are a decide, you decide this language. Do I accept or reject this string? 
if H says that we accept, then we flip it. What that means is D will accept itself only if it doesn't accept itself. Only if it rejects itself or runs forever will it accept. And then vice versa, it will only reject it if it originally accepted. This is a pure contradiction. Basically, this machine we just designed, D, cannot possibly exist. But let's go back one step. If H exists, then we could totally build D. There's nothing about this machine that's fancy or funny. It just simulates a machine. So if H really exists, D should exist. So when we get here, we're basically saying D is impossible. D cannot exist. So our assumption that H exists was also false. So therefore, our set ATM is not decidable. Okay, so again, this machine D here, we call it D for diagonalization. We've designed it in a very way, very weird way to ensure that it is not equal to any Turing machine possible. There's no such Turing machine that could be this D. Therefore, um, our, our set ATM that we assumed was decidable cannot be decided. So what about recognizability? Is there also a language that's not recognizable. Our proof with Cantor argued that yes, there, there must be because there are uncountably infinite uh, languages and there are only countably infinite Turing machines. So there must be a lot of languages that are not decidable and not recognizable. Um, so to do that, we're gonna, I'm gonna do another existence proof first or I'm gonna argue in a more general way. Um, this theorem here says that if L is Turing decidable, then both L and its complement are Turing recognizable. This has two branches because I have it in an if and only if here. I said if then, but it's technically uh, a bidirectional here. Let's try and prove this. Let's make a simple argument first. Let's go in this direction first. So if L is Turing decidable, then L and L uh, bar are Turing recognizable. Let's assume that L is Turing decidable. Then there must be some Turing machine M that decides L. Notice that M also recognizes L. Um, if you're a decider, you're also a recognizer. So L must be recognizable by definition. But then what about the complement? Well, because M is um, decidable, it decides. We know it always accepts or always rejects. We can just swap the accept and reject state and now it will change what it does. Now it will accept all the strings in L bar uh, and therefore uh, it should recognize L bar as well. So this, this machine that decides it uh, can be flipped its states to also recognize the complement language and technically also decide the complement language. So the first branch here, if L is decidable, then they mo both must be recognizable is a little bit easier to prove. Let's go in the opposite direction now. So now we're going to assume that L and L bar are Turing recognizable and we want to build a machine that will decide L for us. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our two machines, M and M bar, that recognize these two languages, and we're going to dovetail them. What that means is we're going to run them in parallel. We're going to run each step one step at, or each machine one step at a time. That way we know that um, what we're guaranteed, because these are both recognizable languages, is either M or M bar is going to halt. They're not guaranteed both to halt. But we're guaranteed they might both halt, but we're guaranteed that one of them will always halt, the other one will not. And that means that's what we have here. One of these machines is guaranteed to halt and accept. We'll just wait till whichever one does. If it's M that accepts, we accept. If it's M bar that accepts, we reject. And that means we can decide this language L. Okay, so what does this why is this theorem helpful for us now? What it also means is if we uh, uh, take this a little bit further, is if a language is not decidable, then it can't be the case that both L and L bar are recognizable. One of them must be unrecognizable. So let's take that a little bit further. We have this language ATM. Let's take a, a variant of it, ATM bar, okay? The complement of ATM. This language is unrecognizable, okay? Now let's do a quick proof by contradiction. Let's assume it is recognizable. We know ATM, its complement, is also recognizable. From that last theorem, that means ATM must be decidable. But from our previous theorem, ATM is not decidable. That's our contradiction. These two contradict each other. So the ATM bar, the complement of ATM, 
must not be recognizable. Okay, this is our, so in this video we've seen our first undecidable language and our first unrecognizable language. These are usually the key ones that we show off. These are very similar to the ones that Turing originally proved, but not exactly. Um, and in our next video, we're going to look at ways that we can now demonstrate that other languages might also be undecidable or unrecognizable. So thanks a lot for watching, and we'll see you in that next video.